Well, thanks again, everybody, for being here, and thank you to Roy and Kristen for co-presenting with me today. Um, so FFI is a project focused on applying current floodplain research to create web-based mapping tools that will allow practitioners in Vermont to characterize floodplain functions, identify and prioritize restoration opportunities, and track progress towards reflecting <laughs> and mitigating phosphorus pollution. So this work is being funded by EP EPA through the Lake Champlain Basin Program uh, grant, as well as some um, other state grants through the Clean Water Initiative Program. And it's being executed by a team, including Vermont ANR, uh, a team of researchers at UVM, consultants from the private sector and nonprofits such as the Nature Conservancy. And just a particular shout out to Mike Klein, who's really the master mastermind behind this project and really great for, grateful to his continued work on this, even in his retirement. This project, it's really the epitome of applied science. Uh, we have this really diverse team of individuals all coming together to synthesize existing and brand new research into tools to address real world needs. Um, and it's been a really great partnership so far and we expect it just to keep growing um, and continuing into the future. So I'd like to start off with just a little background of what instigated this project. Um, you know, going way back in time and history, you know, Euro European colonization, um, you know, 200 plus years ago, dramatically changed the Vermont landscape. You know, we had massive deforestation, channel straightening, draining of the landscape for agriculture and, and other purposes. And the Vermont Rivers Program, we've been collecting stream geomorphic assessment data for almost 20 years. And that data shows that those impacts from early white colonization still persist today. You know, many of our river systems are in size. They've lost access to their floodplains, except for you know only of the, the very largest of floods. And we've used that uh, stream geomorphic assessment data as a foundation on which to move our state policies forward in acknowledging rivers as dynamic systems rather than static elements of the landscape. So our program's philosophy, it really revolves around the idea that rivers need space to adjust to changes on the landscape and that an avoidance strategy which is basically just keeping development out of the river corridor and floodplains is a really cost effective strategy for both increasing resilience to flooding and improving stream stability. And all of that translates to good water quality. So when I, when I say stable, um, I don't mean static. I mean that in the fluvial, fluvial geomorphic sense of uh, you know, a stable channel slope, a stable plan form and a stable channel shape. So the key to a stable channel is connection to its floodplain. And when rivers are able to flow into their floodplains during a flood, the energy of that water gets dissipated, it reduces erosion, and you know, not to mention all the multitude of other ecosystem services related to, to floodplain functions. So our program's work, it's really focused on working with partners, you know, either through land use planning and regulation or through restoration and conservation efforts to restore and maintain river corridor and floodplain functions. So now layer on top of all of that, the Lake Champlain TMDL. As most of you are aware, this is a plan focused on reducing phosphorus inputs to Lake Champlain mandated by the US EPA. And the plan outlines phosphorus loading targets by watershed and the state's charged with implementing mitigation projects to meet those targets. So in order to know if you're reaching your, your target, you have to know how much phosphorus your project is mitigating. And one potential danger of creating an approach like that is if you start picking projects based on you know, how, how easy it is to estimate phosphorus mitigation, rather than the project that you know potentially has the most benefit. So this is a particular challenge for natural resource projects, you know, projects like floodplain and wetland restoration, because um, you know, these are projects that we know they have many benefits, but they're just really hard to quantify in the context of a TMDL because we're dealing with natural systems. These are just inherently messy and complex systems. So this is part of what instigated FFI. You know, we have so many resources flowing towards the TMDL implementation. We wanted to make sure that we didn't just end up with only grand infrastructure solutions where we knew how to calculate phosphorus reductions. We wanted to instead have more resilient natural systems with multiple ecosystem functions to offer, one of them being nutrient mitigation. So, you know, not only are we achieving the nutrient related goals of the TMDL, but also the state's larger and more holistic goals of restoring floodplain functions. So these are the underlying questions that are guiding this project. First, which, which rivers and streams and what percentage of river corridor floodplains are disconnected in a given watershed due to existing constraints or stressors? So basically, you know, what's the current status of things? 
And then secondly, what is the opportunity to readily achieve connectivity? So what can we do to make things better? And then how should connectivity be scored, credited, and tracked at a regional watershed scale to support a strategic restoration and protection plan? So basically, you know, how do we evaluate the benefits of our restoration options? And then what are the highest priority reconnection projects? So you know, how, do we, how do we pick the best ones? So I keep talking about floodplain disconnection, and I just want to make sure that we all understand what I mean by that. There are four types of disconnection that are being considered under FFI. Uh, vertical refers to <clears throat> a river's ability to flow out into its floodplain during a flood event. So you know, rivers can, can become incised, um, you know, where the bed of the channel erodes deeper into the landscape, and, and that can occur for a variety of reasons, but it's often related to some sort of channelization practice. And then as channels become more incised, higher amounts of energy are contained within the channel during flood events, and that can lead to further incision and catastrophic fluvial erosion during a flood. Lateral disconnection <coughs> or connection re re refers to a river's ability to occupy space and move around within its valley bottom. So, you know, oftentimes things like roads and buildings, they can effectively cut off access to the river corridor for the river to move around and, and maintain stability over time. Uh, longitudinal connection refers to a river's ability to transport water, sediment, and wood unimpeded. So things like dams or undersized culverts um, that disrupt the flow of materials, those can ca cause longitudinal disconnection. And then temporal, you know, this is really just about the hydrograph. So the timing and quantity of the delivery of flows through a system in things like dams or impervious surfaces, those are examples of things that can cause temporal disconnection. So here's an example of a floodplain reconnection project you know, from the past. This was the Memorial Valley Rail Trail project, um, or a piece of it anyway. Um, and you know, basically what happened here was you know, an elevated portion of the rail trail that had been retired was taken down to grade and it allowed for floodwaters to access a piece of the floodplain where previously uh, the, the berm had prevented it from doing so. Um, you know, and so water is able to flow out, attenuate, and uh, sediment and phosphorus is stored on the floodplain instead of moving downstream to the lake. And so we've accomplished these types of projects in the past, but what we really need is a systematic way of evaluating them in a way that helps us understand their contribution to the larger system. So the premise that we're working off of in, M in FFI is that ecosystem functions and services are realized when streams, wetlands, and floodplains are connected and stream processes are restored and protected. So the key, the key word here is process. You know, the early days of stream restoration, they were more focused on restoring the physical form of a river. And a lot of those projects were doomed to failure because they really didn't account for the dynamic nature of rivers. So, you know, we're talking about the movement of water and sediment and wood through the system, the connection to the floodplain. You know, if you focus on restoring those processes then the river will recreate the form it needs to maintain those processes. So the tools and development, they'll assess floodplain functions and the degree to which um, they have been lost or threatened at a reach scale. And then the tools will identify restoration and conservation options that would restore those functions by restoring or enhancing stream and floodplain processes. Because we know that restored floodplain functions translate you know, to our those human intrinsic values of floodplains. So namely you know, water quality, flood resilience and, and ecological integrity. So there's really a circular flow to the use of these tools. You know, it's all starting with an evaluation of the degree of departure of floodplain disconnection. And then that's layered with an analysis of, of what opportunities exist for reconnection. So for example, you, know, you might have a reach of river that's heavily encroached upon by roads or buildings, and there might be very little opportunity to restore that you know, lateral connectivity. However, there might be an abandoned dam on that reach, um, and that removal could improve longitudinal connectivity. So the tools will highlight you know, what the opportunities for restoration are and the degree to which they would contribute to the overall connectivity if they were implemented. It'll also be possible to value the restored floodplain functions achieved through reconnection by estimating the cost of flood damages avoided and the cost benefit comparisons with great infrastructure projects with similar water quality benefits. So this will be helpful for prioritizing projects that provide the most functional lift for the lowest cost and also communicating the value of those projects to the general public in dollars. And as restoration and conservation projects are implemented, the tools will allow for tracking of progress over time. So updating of the underlying data to reflect the improved connection achieved through those stream and floodplain 
restoration projects. So this is a this is just a different visual representation of, of what I really just discussed, showing the scales at which FFI the FFI tools can be applied. You know, starting very broadly at the watershed scale and using SGA and other data to identify restoration opportunities, and then narrowing that further by layering on the values and feasibility of projects, and then finally leading to the implementa implementation of individual projects, and you know, which through monitoring and tracking can lead to further refinement of the large scale base data back at the bottom of the period. And then the layers highlighted in blue in the middle, um, that's really where the FFI tools operate. So, you know, we're relying on data inputs at the base and, you know, and then at the top of the project design and implementation that's really occurring outside of the tools. But once those projects are completed, that data um, can go back in at the bottom to, to update our base data. So this project is occurring in phases. You know, it was initiated in, in 2019 and it's currently the, in the currently funded phases, they'll continue through 2022. Um, the phase one of FFI is largely complete and it was focused on developing a scoring system for connectivity through the lens of uh, the four types of connectivity that I, I mentioned earlier. Um, so far, the scoring system has been piloted in the Mad River watershed, and this is just a visual of, of what that looks like. You know, each individual polygon on a subreach scale is getting a connectivity score based on the various variables used to compute that score. Um, and Roy's going to go over in more detail in just a little bit of, of what that's like. Um, let's see. Another aspect of, of the phase one is to consider how different types of restoration could influence the connectivity score. And these are just some examples of some of the different types of restoration projects that are part of that analysis. So the idea is that as you implement restoration projects, you can predict how much credit, how much to credit the, the connectivity score. And here's just a few that are more focused on the longitudinal connection. So phase two of this project, it's building off of phase one and it's bringing in some original research being conducted uh, by folks at UVM. Um, so these research will be used to expand the connectivity scoring scheme created under phase one. And the key pieces here are, are floodplain deline delineation um, using hand modeling done by Rebecca Deal and, and her team, um, sediment regime mapping by, by Kristen Underwood, who will um, tell us more about that in a bit. Um, fine sediment and phosphorus storage on floodplains uh, also being investigated by Rebecca. And uh, wetland nutrient flux led by Dr. Eric Roy at, at UVM. And so, as I said, Kristen's going to provide us some more details on, on that ongoing research in a bit here. Another task is, is the valuation of floodplain functions. And so what we want to do is value restored floodplain functions in terms of the reduction of flood and erosion hazards. And this is a really useful communication tool for helping communities understand the cost effectiveness of investigating, uh, sorry, of investing in, in, in natural capital versus engineered solutions. And this is just a, a visual mock up of what this might look like. This is still very much in development, but you know, basically the idea is you'd be able to click on floodplain reconnection project and see how it compares to a, a gray solution in terms of the cost of avoided damages and, and phosphorus removal. Another task is calculating how much phosphorus load can be reduced through implementation of restoration projects at the scale of a HUC 12 watershed and translating that to phosphorus credits for individual projects to track achievement of the of the TMTL targets over time. And, and again, Roy's gonna go into more detail on that in just a bit. So all this is being delivered through a, a web application. Um, again, this is something that's all under development right now. We're currently just starting in on the, the wire framing. Um, and it'll also include this, you know, we'll, we'll have our user manuals and trainings and outreach materials to help communicate the importance of the and the uses of the tools. So all, all coming. The next phase of FFI that's already being planned um, and funding is being pursued for this is, a, is an add on um, of to the FFI, FFI tools focus on understanding floodplain function and connectivity through the, uh, the lens of habitat. And so the focus of that work will be at, at really at three scales, you know, at the in-channel um, in-stream habitat, uh, near bank and riparian area habitats, as well as floodplain and upland connections. And also in the beginning stages of pursuing resources 
is expanding this work to um, from the Lake Champlain Basin to the rest of Vermont. So currently this work is, is just covering the Lake Champlain Basin, but um, obviously we have a need for these tools uh, statewide. So that's also something being pursued. So with that, I'm going to hand things over to Roy to dig a little deeper into some of the methods that are under development. Thanks, Gretchen. Uh, let me see. OK, looks like I can advance. Um, so I think I'm going to um, jump one ahead here. And so I wanted to just dig a little deeper into many of the slides that um, Gretchen uh, presented. And I'm gonna start my clock here so I don't go over in time. But before I do that, um, I have a list of like 20 people who have worked on all of this information that I'm presenting. And I'm not going to read them all, but I did want to just reiterate, you know, this is a big collaboration and thank, you know, my coworkers at SLR, um, members of Fitzgerald Environmental, members of Fluvial Matters, uh, members of Stone Environmental, as well as the UVM team for all the collaboration. It's really been the, the best part of the project. And, you know, the, the floodplain restoration project that that Gretchen shared with you on um, the Black Creek and the Moyle River was was really a novel project in the state as well as the country. It was one of the biggest floodplain restoration projects at the time. And we learned that in one year um, that project captured captured 32 pounds of phosphorus. Um, and and so um, over time, you know, there's a, there was a lot of uptake on on those floodplains. Uh, it was a ton of phosphorus, but 32 pounds per acre, excuse me, in that year. And really, we needed a way to sy systematically understand what the benefits of floodplain re restoration are, um, as people saw the major benefits. So um, we're going to dig a little deep here, um, try to give you a survey of all the different facets of that. Uh, Jessica, uh, excuse me, that um, Gretchen just. Um, just uh, described to you. So first here on the left is the yeah, Vermont. Right, yeah. I think you need to actually grab control because I don't think you're advancing them for everybody. Okay, thanks. There you go. Is that better? Can you see the scale slide? Yep, yep, that okay, worked. Perfect. Okay, so on the left is an image of the Vermont River corridor in the dotted line. And then in the center, we have the um, corridor as it's broken up by hy hydrologic um, network. And this was embedded in the Vermont State River Corridor. And we had to come up with some unique coding that both matches the geomorphic framework in the state, but also accounts for whether we're in the corridor as in the middle plot or the corridor and the floodplain on the right plot. And then eventually there'll be a, a fourth plot off to the right that has the wildlife corridors and the upland as the habitat progresses. So you may hear me say reaches, um, and really what I'm referring to are these subunits, stream geomorphic segments or, or reaches um, as delineated in the state. And so that's the scale that we're working at for the project. Let's see if I can. Okay, so I wanted to dig a little deeper. Now we developed, um, you know, floodplain connectivity departure scoring. And um, we've allocated, um, we've weighted 50% um, the connection vertical and lateral to the floodplain, 35% the protection scoring, and 15% naturally vegetated buffers. So our target vision for a floodplain is that it's connected laterally and vertically. It's got an easement or protected in perpetuity, and it's got a naturally vegetated um, naturally vegetated floodplain. And then we've divided it by the incision ratio or how well the river is connected to its floodplain vertically. And these ratios come out of project evaluations and some literature, um, and we're refining those as we look at more watersheds. So we can have something that's constrained with a low score or fully connected to the high score. And for the same, at the same time, this stream connectivity, as, as Gretchen mentioned, longitudinal and temporal departure scoring, we've broken this out. And the temporal score is a function of these barriers that exist up and down the river network on the list in the left column, as well as the amount of impervious and connected road network in the, in the um, watershed, as well as the amount of agricultural land that's been drained or altered hydrology. And, and put those together and you get your temporal connectivity score. And then we have a stream connectivity score 
And the longitudinal connectivity score is simply a deduction from, from different structures that work that are in rivers that can disconnect the system. For example, a large flood control dam down to a small breach dam. Now, these are the range of dams we have in the state. We have very few of these large flood control dams. We have many small breach dams or intact dams, as well as we have bridges of all different geomorphic size. So we have GIS state level and also stream reach level assessment data to allow us to do this scoring. And we come up with a score. And again, the goal is a connected functioning system. Keep pressing my buttons. Okay, so so a big aspect of this project um, is to select projects and prioritize them. And I want to just run through an example of the algorithm we have developed um, that selects the, the floodplain reconnection approach. And so the, the approaches are restoring lateral and vertical connectivity, removing constraints, protecting the land, the floodplain, and revegetating it in the buffer. And that's a function of the incision ratio and your departure scoring. So, so obviously, if you have a non-incised channel and you're very well connected and protected and have a good buffer, you're not going to do any actions. And on the other side of the spectrum, if you're disconnected and you're incised, you might connect, you know, do a lateral vertical connection. And then we move down a layer in detail and look at actual project types. So you can see in the lateral vertical connectivity, there are many kinds of projects. You can lower a floodplain, reconnect a flood chute, create benches. Usually we do this around some infrastructure. And again, there's a whole selection algorithm that I'm not going to dig too deep into to actually prioritize and select, excuse me, to select projects. Um, and then finally, we actually prioritize projects. So for example, if we're on a heavily incised reach and there's not a lot of stuff in the floodplain, meaning we don't have um, conflicts like roads or houses, then we might lower that floodplain and reactivate the, 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 con the connectivity in the floodplain process. Likewise, if you have a berm, you'll remove that. And so the FFI is gonna offer a way for people to start screening sites and select projects um, based on the geomorphic data and the GIS data that exists in the state. It's a really exciting tool. Um, I'm gonna show you, build on those that little snippet of the wireframe Gretchen showed. And this was prepared by Stone Environmental, Jody Barb and their team. And here's the homepage. So this is really exciting to see where you might enter the website the FFI website, and you might explore data or go through a planning process to understand what project benefits you might get. Um, submit your project info to track projects. Import project data into the water protection database. So we're going to link to other existing databases to really track um, P and, uh, and other projects, phosphorus. Um, and here's, I just wanted to give you a snippet of the planning aspects. And if you look at the figure on the left, you can search by an area. You can choose the scale if I'm in a HUC 12, or I can go down to a subunit or segment. Um, also, I can choose by the function um, of a project, um, the type of a project, um, or the priority. And here's some functions, improving channel stability, um, uh, material storage, such as nutrients and sediment, as well as naturalizing habitat. So no matter, we're trying to make this broadly applicable for a range of users, depending on what your vision is. You could come in here and say, I want to find every buffer planting um, option in my HUC 12 basin, and it, the priority buffer planting areas will pop up. You could also say, I want to find the most desired project to get the best, the most cost-effective P removal project in an area, and you can find that as well. And then there'll be a map-based interface. Um, where you can click around and, and test out scenarios and projects. So really exciting that the app development that's taking place um, with Stone Environmental. Um, we're going to switch gears a little to look at that green versus gray um, uh, project cost effectiveness. And I'm going to zoom through a few weeks of research that Fitzgerald Environmental um, and, and um, Evan and myself worked on. And we looked at project costs that include management and administration, assessment, design, and permitting, bid and oversight, O&M, and monitoring. And then we also looked at the, the restoration characteristics based on those project types we just looked at. Um, and then we have some, some TP retention from literature and also from some data. And Kristen's going to um, show you some of that, some of those data. And here's a quick summary. Um, I'm going to jump through this slide, but there's like three spreadsheets behind this that we can never see on the screen. 
here are some spreadsheets that you can see um, that just summarize on the left natural resource projects on the right stormwater BMP projects. And OK, here's kind of one of the take homes. So the top are gray infrastructure projects, infiltration practices, filtering and ponds. And down on the left are a few of the green infrastructure projects that I extracted. And if you see a number of 1.0, it means that the cost of that stormwater practice is equal to the cost of that natural re resource practice on a dollar per pound of total phosphorus removed, right? And the first thing that should jump out at you, if you wanted to, to remove as much phosphorus in the most cost-effective way doing stormwater natural resource projects, your answer is obviously burn removal. It's at least six, if not 70 times more cost effective than many of our gray infrastructure approaches going across the top. So all these red numbers say that the traditional gray stormwater infrastructure um, is way more expensive. And it's because the efficiency of floodplains to take up phosphorus blows away um, the, the stormwater applications. And you check out the one way on the right, the extended dry detention pond is, is more than 60 times more costly per pound of phosphorus than a berm removal. Um, it's interesting to note that some of the infiltration practices come out close to some of the natural resource practices. And that's because some of these practices are really expensive. Some of them, like dam removal, have many other benefits, and they're also um, on a little more um, linked to infrastructure work. So some of those, and these are based on many projects in the state. We still have a little more work to do here. But once you get into the filtering practices and the pond practices and the stormwater treatment arena, all the natural resource practices are way more cost effective, at least, um, you know, 1.7, 1.5. And now you're once you start going to I, mean, I always thought give grass swales were kind of an easy, simple way to get rid of pee from from conveying water. But it turns out that they're actually a lot more costly on a, on a per pound of phosphorus. Um, here's a quick plot showing um, stormwater infrastructure practices across the bottom that ratio of stormwater cost per pound of total phosphorus divided by the natural resource cost. And for this project, it's the floodplain lowering. These are all about the same on the left. And then you can see the cost. We're typically over twice as costly, four times as costly for grass swales, almost 10 times as costly um, to, to treat um, phosphorus on a per pound basis um, compared um, detention ponds compared to floodplain lowering. So really, really, the, the data really highlight the effectiveness of natural resource projects. Um, so we're going to dip into the crediting here, and I'd be remiss not to um, acknowledge Mike Klein. He's put a lot of work into this, um, in this new venture, um, Fluvial Matters. Um, and on the left you know, are the projects that, um, that um, uh, Gretchen had shown already on floodplain connectivity and stream connectivity. And here we have a methodology for starting to, to credit channels, um, to credit, excuse me, projects and how they um, re, uh, reduce phosphorus. And uh, what I, I'm just going to summarize this and then show you some examples. On the, on the left here, for lateral and vertical, like when we do a floodplain lowering, we get a credit associated with improving that departure score and reconnecting vertical. Um, and then this SSP stands for um, specific um, stream power, and that's something that's in the works. Kristen might touch on that a little bit. But then we have these deductions that you return. So, for example, if you remove a small breach dam, um, you're going to get a credit back that's going to translate into a P credit, and I'll, and I'll show you that um, relationship. And again, based on past projects um, and, and some literature. So here's a slide on the left. So one thing we we were a little surprised by is that we needed to take the TMDL subbasin baseload allocations and get those down to a level where we could actually say if you did a project, you take a little bit off um, of that allocation. So on the left is the state of Vermont. The colorized um, these are called subbasins. We learned um, after many emails, we figured we kind of digested this. Um, this is the Champlain Basin. The plot in the middle shows three um, TMDL subbasins, excuse me, three Huck 12s. Oh, wait, now Mad River Watershed, three TMDL subbasins in a Huck 12. So we added these together. So there are, so a um, subbasin can have one or more Huck 12s in them. And so we have a value now that's in the TMDL. 
And then what we did was based on our departure scoring on connectivity, as well as area weighting in the um, corridor, we allocated those to either the subunit segment or reach. OK, and this is a uh, a, um, a tree that shows how this works. So the top is the base load allocation in the TMDL, and we split that between headwaters and um, lower floodplains. And I'm just going to focus in this area because we have an example. We split that between the stream connectivity, the longitudinal and um, and temporal, as well as the floodplain connectivity, the lateral and vertical. And again, we've allocated based on project performance, you know, what um, what that split of the, of the P load could be. Um, there's a lot behind here. This is could be a couple hour presentation on its own. So. Um, I'm going to share this with you, and if you look at the slides or the video, you will you can kind of follow this tree. The red numbers indicate the percent split at each level, and then the black numbers indicate, you know, how much portion of the HUC 12 p allocation gets allocated to that um, component of floodplain connectivity. So, for example, in this HUC 12 basin, 27% or 968 kilograms per year are associated with vertical connectivity. 4% or 145 kilograms per year with um, with buffers. And then we go in um, and we're going to zoom into that floodplain connectivity. And then you can see we've allocated 22 and a quarter kilograms per year based on our departure scoring. Um, so the TMDL based P loads are allocated to stream reaches as weighted by river corridor area. And then here's a relationship from the Mad River pilot. Um, that shows the P allocation in kilograms per acre per year versus floodplain connectivity scoring. Now, I'm going to have to speed up here. Um, the P crediting um, really accounts for three elements. The first in the upper left is the TMDL unstable streams, but there are other credits you get for phosphorus, and this is a ongoing um, you know, policy discussion at the state. Um, where this this second blue circle is one for storage. That's really not accounted for in the TMDL. This is when you reconnect a floodplain. Um, our research is showing that you get between 10 and 30 kilograms per acre per year on that floodplain. But the TMDL really focuses on it's an unstable streams allocation. And then finally, when you do a floodplain reconnection project or a dam removal project, you're actually physically removing sediment and nutrients as part of the project. And this is something we have reported on around the state. So there's really three elements. And depending on your project, these elements um, change. And also these elements change over time, which is something we're starting to think about. So if you remove a berm, you remove material, you create storage, and you physic, excuse me, you you uh, stabilize your channels and allow it to move through evolution, which is the basis of the TMDL, you create storage and then you physically remove material. If you're doing a buffer planting, you're not physically removing material, but you're actually improving the functioning of the floodplain and creating a little more storage. So again, all a work in progress. So here's a couple examples. Um, here's the base load allocation for the HUC-12. Here's the allocations based on the different um, floodplain connectivity components. Um, the total riparian buffer acres of 2.5 approximately. 50 foot buffers with naturally vegetation. So we already have some that's that's met the the, the target. Then we have a bunch with we have 1.4 acres without vegetation. And the project is planting an acre of vegetation. We have that's about a 71.4% buffer credit because we're treating you know 71% of this 1.4. You multiply that by the 2.54 and you have a 1.881 kilogram per year P removal credit for that area planted. Finally, um, opening a flood chute, another way to connect, um, a, you know, connect a floodplain. We've started to do this around Vermont. Now we're addressing the vertical connectivity, the bold element in the in the right of the table, and the river corridor area is 47.84 acres. And if our project reconnects five acres of corridor, we're only addressing 10%. So we would get 10% of that vertical connectivity credited back to our um, to our project. But we're also reconnecting five acres of functioning floodplain. So we get a 10 kilogram per year um, per acre um, allocation be on that storage side, that second blue circle. So we get 50 kilograms per year P removal. So you add those together. And the question we're sort of grappling with now and we need to, to talk to folks about is, you know, what comes off the TMDL? Um, 
I guess by definition right now would only be 7.73, but you also have this large allocation, um, you know, that could come off uh, associated with the storage element. So um, I know I blew through a lot there and um, I'm going to turn it over to Kristen so she can go through her slides and then maybe we can address some questions. I saw a few pop up. Thanks, Roy. Um, switching gears here a little bit. Um, I'm going to bring you uh, some of the recent results from research that's being conducted at UVM in support of this functioning floodplain initiative. Um, and I'll start with uh, sediment regime classes. Uh, here we're building on the more than 20 years of data collection that Gretchen referenced earlier in the presentation from stream geomorphic assessments. We know that our rivers are very complex systems that exhibit lots of variability in their tendency to produce sediment and transport sediment as well as deposit that sediment. Some reaches are more transport dominated and some are more erosion prone. Um, others are key areas for deposition that we want to leverage. Uh, for planning purposes, we can classify rivers at a reach scale into these various sediment regimes or what some might call sediment process domains. Um, relying on these same stream geomorphic assessment data sets from six watersheds in Vermont, our team recently published our work to use machine learning algorithms to classify the sediment regime of river reaches here in Vermont. And this smart classifier builds upon classification system that Mike Klein originally proposed in the river quarter planning guide that many of you are familiar with um, that's used to inform our planning for river quarter protection and restoration projects. These six sediment regime classes span the range of river types that we see here in Vermont, ranging from those reaches that are confined closely by their valley walls, um, the two reaches that we see in the upper in the shading shaded gray, uh, to those that are much lower gradient and in unconfined valley settings, those reaches four classes at the bottom. They also range in um, degree of vertical disconnection from the floodplain from those classes on the left hand side that are well connected to their floodplain to those reach classes on the right hand side that are vertically disconnected from the floodplains um, as a result of incision or other channel management activities. We know that reaches can become incised in response to either natural or human disturbances. Um, we can focus on some human causes that have disconnected rivers, both vertically and laterally from the floodplain. Historically, we've made land use choices that encroach upon our rivers, removing meanders and um, disconnecting or isolating portions of the floodplain. Many of our village settlements, in fact, are in floodplains. And the presence of this riverside infrastructure leads us to manage rivers through channelization and dredging and armoring to protect those investments. And when channels become incised and lose floodplain connection, more floodwaters are contained within the channel cross section and the stream channel then experiences higher stream power. This increase in stream power can then influence the sediment regime of the reach, converting a deposition dominated reach into more erosion prone reach that now becomes a net source of both fine and coarse sediments to the downstream reaches. We know from many years now of experience um, that managing our rivers to persist in this incised state in order to protect riverside investments uh, is very costly and it's unsustainable over the long term, especially as we anticipate greater frequency of, of flooding in, in a changing climate. So many of our river reaches are in this state and serve as a source of sediment to downstream reaches. But if we can instead support the natural channel evolution process, we'll reconnect our channels vertically and laterally to their floodplains over time. Um, 
we can pursue this reconnection through passive restoration techniques like river quarter easements or adopting river quarter bylaws, uh, even planting trees in floodplains and at the extents of river quarters. With time, a channel will widen and degrade to recover access to the floodplain or a new floodplain at a lower elevation. And these protected and actively adjusting reaches then become key attenuation assets, locations for floodwater storage and coarse sediment storage. And eventually they'll become uh, good locations to store fine sediments and nutrients as they regain their floodplain access. We can also restore or reconnect our rivers through active restoration projects. This is um, an example from Beecher Hill Brook on the La Platte River in Hinesburg that Roy's firm and Jessica Luisos worked on. Um, this is a, a way to accelerate that um, channel evolution process. Uh, the town of Hinesburg, the town garage had been perched along the riverside and berms had been installed to protect this infrastructure from flooding over the years. With funding from Agency of Natural Resources and other sources, the town garage was moved uh, away from the river in 2018 and the berms were removed. The natural floodplain was restored and the channel was raised using log and, and stone structures. And essentially this work transformed uh, a channel from a transport dominated condition in which it was a source of sediment into a more depositional dominated system where floodwaters can now access the floodplain and the sediment can be stored. So these projects can be costly, but we're finding through Roy's research and Evan's research that they can have surprisingly high benefit cost ratios, especially when we consider all the many services provided to society by this fully functioning floodplain. Reaches that are stable and well connected to their floodplains are also quite valuable and worthy of conservation to protect the very functions that they provide, including sediment and nutrient storage and soil building, groundwater recharge and floodwater storage for uh, flood resilience uh, in downstream communities. So, to better understand the degree to which our floodplains are functioning statewide, additional research has been undertaken at UVM to map floodplains, as was mentioned previously. Rebecca Deal has been leading this work uh, with funding from the Lake Champlain Basin Program, among others, and also the FFI project. Um, she has been mapping using a low complexity mapping approach, hydraulic model known as height above nearest drainage or hand for short. Um, and we've extended these hand methods using a Monte Carlo approach that addresses uncertainty in the model parameters to generate kind of what are described as probabilistic uh, floodplain maps for a variety of design storms. And we're downscaling this hand approach presently under the FFI project from NHD plus reaches, which are at a coarser scale, down to our stream geomorphic assessment reach scale, so that these data can be a little more compatible and consistent with the geomorphic assessment data that has been collected and archived for many of these reaches. At the same time, Rebecca is monitoring or has been monitoring um, deposition of floodwater sediments on 170 plots located at 24 sites distributed across the Vermont portion of Lake Champlain Basin. And we're assessing the mass of sediment and phosphorus stored on these plots. And then also developing statistical relationships that link this deposition mass to catchment scale and site scale variables or attributes and this will enable us to extrapolate estimates of sediment and phosphorus deposition on floodplains of different types across the basin. This work has been summarized already in a draft report delivered to LCBP which will become publicly available this summer. The 24 sites uh, ranged in slope from 
0.001% to 0.6% with drainage areas ranging between 11 and 2,700 kilometers squared. Um, and these sites corresponded to channel specific stream power values between 0.4 and 86 watts per meter squared. So these are fairly low energy systems or sites located on fairly low energy systems. We had a grouping of um, medium energy sites separate from low energy sites and found somewhat surprisingly that the medium energy sites uh, accumulated slightly higher mass of both sediment and phosphorus than did the low energy sites at least that were monitored by uh, Rebecca's crew. This next plot shows deposition rates for sediment and that's indicated with the orange bars and total phosphorus with the red bars at 22 sites that, that were inundated during 2019. Surprisingly, 2020 was a rather dry year. We had no inundation events on these 24 sites, unfortunately. But we have lots of data to work with from 2019, principally from the Halloween storm that occurred around the 1st of November. Uh, and you can see that phosphorus deposition is closely related to uh, sediment deposition. And the concentration of phosphorus in these floodplain sediments, which you can read off the right-hand axis, varied from between 600 and 800 milligrams per kilogram, roughly, which is fairly consistent with uh, stream bank monitoring data from around the basin, collected by Don Ross and others over the years. Um, there are a few outlier sites on this plot you can see um, that, ref that were um, associated with agricultural uses that involved phosphorus amendments. Uh, but generally speaking, um, we're seeing across all 24 sites a range of phosphorus deposition rates from 0.2 to 30 pounds of phosphorus per acre per year. And at our sites, this, this corresponds to between 0.8 and 164% of the annual phosphorus load transported in the, the river adjacent to these sites. So on the left-hand side, you can see one example from uh, a recently reconnected floodplain um, at Water Street Park on the Dog River in Northfield. Um, most, as I mentioned, most of the sediment and phosphorus accumulated that we've been able to measure so far did come during that Halloween storm around November 1st of 2019. Also in these floodplains, we have some wetland systems. And in those riparian wetlands, we're measuring uh, and modeling mechanisms of particulate phosphorus retention and soluble phosphorus release. And this work is being led by Eric Roy from the Rubenstein School of Environment and Natural Resources with funding from the Lake Champlain Basin Program as well as the Functioning Floodplain Initiative. And we know that phosphorus can be retained in wetlands through a variety of methods, including deposition of particles that are carried into the wetlands by floodwaters but phosphorus can also be released from wetlands through a variety of mechanisms, um, principal among those being diffusion of soluble reactive phosphorus out of soils. Ongoing research led by Eric Roy and his student Adrian Weigman is aiming to relate the predominance of P retention and SRP release to various landscape variables so that a kind of risk map can be developed to project the likelihood of these floodplain features to serve as either a source or a sink of phosphorus over uh, varying time intervals um, and to better understand the degree to which they serve as a source versus a sink. Part, as part of that work um, and to evaluate the potential for release of soluble reactive phosphorus in wetland soils during flooding, 
Um, Adrian Weigman has been collecting soil cores from 14 sites across the Lake Champlain Basin. These include restored wetlands located in historically drained and farmed soils, plus one active farm. And to simulate the exposure of flooding uh, and both aerobic and anaerobic conditions, laboratory incubations were carried out to expose these soil cores to filtered river water that was bubbled through with room air or with nitrogen gas um, to address aerobic or anaerobic conditions, respectively. Soluble reactive phosphorus concentrations were then tested in the water column above the cores at approximate daily time steps. And what they're finding through some preliminary results is that some soils released very little soluble phosphorus, while others released more, particularly under anaerobic conditions. And this preliminary data from 2019 and 2020 suggests that the degree of SRP release decreases with time since farming. And certain soil metrics, like soil phosphorus storage capacity, for example, are able to reasonably predict the risk of soluble phosphorus loss. So in 2021, this coming season, Eric Roy and his team will be expanding this core retrieval work to six additional sites to fill out um, more of their data set. And at the same time, um, Adrian is engaged in some process-based modeling and very intensively monitored sites at three locations, in the, two in the Otter Creek, one in the Lewis Creek, um, to better understand that balance between uh, sediment deposition or particulate phosphorus retention and the potential for soluble phosphorus release. And results of this work will be available this fall uh, and will help to inform the risk mapping that will be developed and uh, serve as a layer uh, within the project prioritization um, algorithms that underlie the FFI web app. And so in the interest of time, I'll stop there. And I know we have just a few minutes left for questions, but um, I'll pause it there. Thank you so much, uh, Gretchen, Roy, and Kristen. That was a wonderful um, presentation. Um, just to let folks know it is almost one. We are going to stay on for a little bit past to answer some questions. If you can stay on, that's great. If not, the recording will be available and you can watch this afterwards. Um, so our first question is about data source. Was the program was this calculated using data only from DEC's clean water database or were there other data sources used? Um, I, I believe that question was referring to the valuation. Um, so we have, so first off for the stormwater, um, if I'm correct, the stormwater projects, there was a recent um, DEC funded project where uh, they looked at O&M costs as well as costs of stormwater practices. So that was looked at the full database. Um, that's where the stormwater numbers came from. Um, we are in the process of building out the natural resource side. So we've done a lot of projects that members of our project team have worked on. Um, for example, for the floodplain restoration, many of the examples, many of the examples you've heard about today have come from out of our teams. Um, we do have um, the rivers program has given us a download from the from the databases and where we need to kind of go through those. Um, one thing we find is like the the data are not consistent, so we have to make some assumptions. And I saw some really good questions about that, but um, it's a bit of a work in progress right now on the valuation side to refine those numbers. Awesome, thank you. Um, our next question is for you, Roy, again. Um, this is from Neil. Um, Neil, did you want to unmute and ask your question um, verbally? Sure, definitely. So, Roy and uh, Kristen and everybody else, just absolutely amazing. This is so, so cool. Um, when you were talking about the deposition, so the, the phosphorus deposition in the floodplains and specifically referencing Rebecca's work. So that first iteration basically talks about like that first drop of nutrient into the floodplain, like after a flood event. So we've captured X amount. That report acknowledges that we don't quite 
understand yet the mechanics of how much of that might come off in the next flood or transport elsewhere. And I'm wondering how much progress has been made since Rebecca's initial rollout to sort of what you've got here, because it's relevant for all the cost benefit analysis numbers. Yeah. Yeah, Neil, I mean, you kind of hit, I think, one of the biggest um, challenges, I would say, of this work is there's, I mean, Rebecca's project, um, from what I've seen, is really novel. Like, we don't have systematic measurements of floodplain P. Um, we certainly don't have, like, budgeting over long time scales, which is really what we need to refine these numbers. So I think you're right that um, that those values that Kristen showed, Kristen, maybe a slide or two forward, whoever's moving it, like the, the 0.3 to 30, you know, all the measurements we're falling are, are kind of, we have a lot of examples now that I'll say 10 to 20 to 30 on all different sizes and different settings, pounds, P per acre per year. But the fate and their resuspension and redeposition and probably the timing of that is really critical of when the plants are growing, when the deposition takes place. So um, I think um, the best I can say is we just don't know that for sure. And there's really little information in the literature. And one thing we haven't said is that, you know, we're trying to set up a framework and methodology here. Now, if we if we learn that over time the function of a floodplain like for p uptake drops like we think like that can be put back into this whole framework but right now we're going to kind of do our best and make assumptions we are we do need to add in some life cycle thinking and so that's kind of on the horizon of how we change this this 0.2 to 30 pounds p breaker per year over time um, and if we should be changing it so it's, it's a great question um We'd love if anyone has ideas. I, we'd love to hear them. And it, yeah, work in progress. And Kristen, I definitely should have referenced you in that because I know that was a lot of your work too. So no, no worries. I would just add as well that I know Re Rebecca has been um, pursuing some additional funding to do dendrochronology work that would help us get a little more of a better picture of deposition over time. Um, and so we're hopeful that some of those grants will hit to help us answer this time question. Cool. I'm so sorry I have to leave, but thank you, you guys. Incredible. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Here we have time for a couple more questions. I want to be aware, uh, presenters, do you guys have a few more minutes to answer questions? I want to be aware of your time as well. Um, sure. Got a question from Matt about assumptions that went into green versus gray project effectiveness comparisons. Um, does this assume that berms are located immediately along top of bank or is there some kind of offset? Um, great question. Um, there are there are a lot of assumptions that go into this work. Um, right now, the berm removals we're using um, are in a variety of locations because they're based on Vermont projects that we've done in the past. So some of them are immediately adjacent to the river and eroding, and some of them are out way back in a floodplain to protect some some farm field or infrastructure. So it, it actually, the answer is for that, it varies. Um, but those are real data. And um, if you think about it, the re the floodplain reconnection is really um, an effective way to get at least that first flush of of p on the floodplain and possibly over the long term as neil was just discussing but the the work to get that floodplain reconnected is the minimum typically um, with just removing a small trapezoid of fill so that's why that looks so cost effective relative to all the other um, approaches awesome thank you um, maybe just one more question and then maybe uh, we could get you guys to answer some of the remaining questions and we could send it out to attendees afterwards. Would that be all right? Awesome. Thank you. Um, how will floodplain projects be credited in the lake segment basements without a stream load allocation? Oh boy. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of something we'll have to figure out. Um, to be honest, I we're sort of just wrapping up the the methods for the ones with the load allocation. So one thing we're learning is that, you know, the other challenge, which I'm scared to bring up because there's so many people who are going to like 
have so many ideas and great questions, but the headwaters are, are another sort of challenge is like, how do we separate that, that load allocation? And so and I think what I'd say is we're going to try to build relationships based on the areas of the of the stream reaches and the and the Huck 12s and perhaps make an approximate allocation, um, you know, based on a, on a relationship. And that was kind of the nature of that scatter plot of our departure scoring versus payload allocation and that we might be able to, you know, use such a relationship for this and on the crediting side to work in the headwaters where we don't have as much data because there's a lot smaller streams um, for certain aspects. So um, we're going to have to build some relationships um, out of all these data to apply to areas where we have gaps in data. And it's it is a challenge working in in a large basin like the Champlain Basin or even the full state if we're headed that way. I don't know if you want to add anything, Kristen. Uh, just that, you know, there's some fancy tools available, uh, you know, clustering tools and whatnot that that can help us in that um, extrapolation, I would say, hopefully. Awesome. Well, thank you guys. Um, and I am I will follow up with you guys with some of the remaining questions and maybe we can get those answered and sent out to attendees. I want to thank you guys so much for your time. The presentation was amazing. I learned so much. Um, and yeah, thank you everyone for attending. Thank you for those who were able to stay on and Look forward to the next one. Thanks for having us. Yes, thank you. Thanks, see y'all later.